Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everyone, welcome back to Quantum Mechanics. Last time we talked about complex linear vector spaces equipped with an inner product. Today we're going to talk about linear operators. We're not going to use the inner product much, but we will use pretty heavily the concept that we ended with last time, that is a concept of a basis. So, linear operators. First of all, let's, let's get the definition out of the way. A linear operator on a complex vector space. Actually, let me back up. It doesn't have to be a complex vector space, just any vector space. So a linear operator on a, cert on a vector space V assigns to any vector, psi, another vector, a psi in V. Now, where does linearity come from? Linearity is embodied in this statement right here. What it tells me is if I take a linear combination of vectors and act on it with a, then I'm going to get a new vector, which is a linear combination of the image of the vectors under A individually. So this is a nice definition. So linear combinations are preserved. That's one way to look at it. This is a nice definition because it's very checkable. If we can always check when we have a linear operator, once we know what the appropriate vector space is. That's why we spent some time on general definition of vector space. So a particular example that we're going to see in this course is think of the f think of the space L2 last time of square integral functions, um, complex valued functions, differentiation of those. So we take each function and we associate with it its derivative. Now I, here I've multiplied it by a factor of i. I can multiply it by any complex number. We're going to see what we actually want to do this later on. But this is a good example of a linear operator that I'm going to leave to you at the moment to prove that it's linear. We'll come back to that in the next lecture, this particular example. But the examples I really want you to learn about are examples on finite dimensional vector spaces, in particular CN. That's a complex vector space, and we know what the inner product is on that vector space. So an important fact from linear algebra is if we have a linear operator and we have a basis on our vector space, that linear operator is determined by how it acts on each basis vector. So what does that mean? Well, here's just a little example. C3. Okay, let's suppose C3 has three basis vectors, E1, E2, E3. Let A act on E1, E2, and E3. A, E1 is a vector in C3. So because E1, E2, E3 is a basis, it can be represented as a linear combination of the basis vectors. And so on for the other two. Okay, so let's consider this in more detail for an example that is really um, uh, embodies most of what we're going to be doing in the course related to linear operators on finite dimensional complex inner product spaces. So we're going to consider Cn. All right, and let's consider a vector space. Sorry, let's consider a basis E1 through En on Cn. Now, I don't assume anything about that basis, it's, whether it's orthonormal or anything like that at this point. It's just a basis. So because Cn is n-dimensional, I have n linearly independent vectors. Now let's consider a linear operator acting on Cn. So what do we want to do with that? Well, I told you that a linear operator is, is determined by how it acts on basis elements. Now, determined for us is going to be a matrix representation is determined with respect to that basis. 
and this is how we derive that, that matrix representation. This example in these two pages is incredibly important. If you understand this example, you're going to have an easy time with much of what we do later on. So I encourage you to go through it in some detail, but I'll, I'll, I'll outline the necessary steps. So A, our linear operator, let it act on each basis element. And what is it? Well, A acting on a basis element is a vector in the space. So it can be represented as a linear combination of the basis elements. And I write it here, A, J, I, E, J. OK, the A, J, I, I are just the components corresponding to the vector A, E, I. Now they have two indices, one for um, the um, basis element E, I, and the other one corresponding to the sum over all the other basis elements. And so this is going to be, as we're going to see shortly, the matrix representation of A. Okay, so what are we trying to get at? We have the matrix, we have the linear operator A. We've let it act on each, each basis element. So the idea is, if we have any vector, x, we're going to call it, and we let A act on x, we can determine how A acts on x by determining how its matrix transforms the components of the vector x. What are the components? Well, if I write this, x is a vector in the space, so we can represent it as a linear combination of basis elements. So we, let's say that y, that ax, will, is equal to y. Well, y is also a vector in the space. So we can write it as a linear combination of the basis vectors. OK, now let's look at equation 118. That tells me what a, does, what a is acting on each basis element. So y equals, we can substitute this in to the formula. And we know that if two vectors are equal, the components on each basis vector must be equal. So if we equate these two, there we have it right here. This tells us that this matrix, AJI, transforms the components of the vector x into the components of the vector y, which is mapped to. Now, if we did happen to have an orthonormal basis, let's say that EI, I equal 1 to N, is orthonormal, then we can use the inner product to get the basis elements in a very nice way. So what we see here, remember this is our notation for the inner product, the curly, the, the curled or curved braces, um, the inner product of EJ with AEI. Okay, but AEI is this. Now is when you need to be careful because remember, this is in this these constants are in the right-hand side of the right entry of the inner product. So when we pull them out to the left, we don't do anything to them. I mean, we don't complex conjugate them. So we go here. And then EIEJ is, because of orthonormality, it's going to be 0, they're orthogonal, unless j equals k. And we embody this in the Kronecker delta, delta jk. Delta jk is 1 if j equal k, it's 0 if j is not equal to k. And there we have the basis elements. So if we look at a simpler example, this example here goes back to the original example. Let's suppose that we have 
c2. If we can do it for two dimensions, we can usually do it for n dimensions. So if you're having trouble for understanding something in n dimensions in a linear algebra context, work it out for two dimensions. One dimension is too trivial, obviously. Okay, so let e1, e2 be an orthonormal basis of c2. Now, a little wrinkle is going to come in this with respect to complex numbers that you'll see in a second. Okay, so how do I define A? I define A by how it acts on each basis element. And this is up to me to construct my linear operator. So AE1 is 3E1 plus 2IE2. AE2 is just doesn't do anything to it. So, so now if we want to get the matrix elements, for this simple two-dimensional example using the general n-dimensional formula I gave above, it's this, two by two matrix. Now, you can almost, if I, if you look at this, you can see how you can essentially read off the matrix elements from equation 120. I just mention that parenthetically because we're going to see how easy it's going to be as we look at specific examples. Okay, so this is the matrix corresponding to the linear operator defined in this way for this base basis. That's very important. The matrix elements depend on the basis. Remember I said last lecture that choosing the right basis can make things very simple. We're going to see the best way to choose bases a little bit later to do that and what simple might mean. So let's see how this matrix representation transforms two-dimensional vectors in C2. Well, we do this by picking, let's pick a particular vector. Uh, let's let x equal 2e1 plus ie2, just as an example. Well, we need specific basis elements. Okay, so let's pick the simplest type of basis elements for C2. Let's let E1 be 1, 0. Let's let E2 be 0, 1. Sometimes when I've taught this course, some students have objected. They're saying C2 is complex. Why doesn't it have to have a complex basis? I'll let you think about that a little bit, and then we can discuss it in the problem session or after some of the lectures. Okay, so in this basis, x happens to be this, right? So if we want to know what a does to x, we take the matrix representation, we let it act on the vector formed by the components of this. We all know how to do matrix multiplication of a 2 by 2 by times a column vector, and we get this. And then we can pull it apart and represent it if we want to in terms of the original basis. Okay, I can't emphasize enough that these three little examples in this section, if you really understand them deeply, you're going to have no problem with what we're doing uh, in the course, because it, they're just simple examples that embody these ideas completely. So let me finish. Ah, there's a little technical detail down here, which I just mentioned, but it doesn't hurt to mention this enough. If you change the basis, you change the matrix representation. Okay, I just said that earlier, but if you change the basis in the right way, you can make the matrix really simple, like diagonal maybe. We'll see that a little bit later on. So let me mention one thing. Bounded linear operators, those are going to be important for us. In finite dimensions, every linear operator is bounded. And there's a little proof here. I'm not going to have you reproduce the proof or examine you on it. Uh, basically, a bounded linear operator is one which, when you let it act on a vector, it doesn't make its norm grow unboundedly. So for finite dimensions, they're all bounded. But in infinite dimensions, it's much more tricky. And we're going to see that in the next chapter when we... Uh, look at partial differential, the Schrodinger equation, which is a partial differential equation, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Okay, that's enough for
today for these basic um, basic notions here. So what have we done so far? We started off in the previous lecture by looking at complex vector spaces equipped with an inner product, and I I reminded you of the idea of the ba of a basis on a vector space. Okay, today I defined a linear operator acting on a vector space. When we talked about that initially, linearity didn't require a inner product or anything like that. Then we talked about matrix representation and how we used a basis to realize that linear operator in a particular basis so that we could operate on it, so that we could look at what it did to vectors. All right, and that's not unique. That can change with respect to the basis. It does beg the question of, well, does it, well, what, what is unchanged when you, uh, with respect to a basis? What's invariant under the choice of basis? Interesting problem, but we're not, we're not um, looking at that yet. Okay, but then the three examples, learn them carefully. There's not too much, just, and, and if there's any doubt you have about them, ask me. Make sure you get the indices right. When I was writing this book the first few times, I, you know, I, I drop an index in the wrong place. I'm sure they're all right, but very likely you may think I made a mistake. That's a good point for discussion. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about in this lecture, but in the next lecture, we're going to talk about self-adjoint operators and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now we get into the real meat of quantum mechanics. We use everything we've done in the previous lecture, but we're going to talk about it in a very specific type of way. Okay. That's it for today. I hope uh, you enjoyed that. And um, you have, if you have any questions, we'll have a chance to uh, discuss them in person soon. And I will see you the next time when we talk about self-adjoint operators and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Goodbye, everyone.